57th event that uh, certain people have organised for Tamworth Literary Festival. Um, one person who never gets any of the plaudits, I have to say, is the older one at the front. No, I meant older than your daughter, so that's what I meant. Um, so, during the evening, please say hello and thank you to Tina, because she's, she's a good girl, really, most of the time. Pretend not to be. When you can get her to do something. Yeah. She's, um, Secretarial position is available if you want it, by the way. So, yes, good evening and welcome. Fantasy panel. Um, it should have been chaired by Andrew Spark, who's been struck down by something terrible. Um, it would have then been chaired by David Wake. No, I've not seen it. No, absolutely not. No. But I, I lost the arm wrestling. Or did I win the arm wrestling? <laughs> we'll wrestle for it afterwards. So, unfortunately, you've got me. Uh, I am not a fantasy author. Um, I have never written anything fantastic or fan fantastical, I suppose would be a better word, wouldn't it, um, that I'm willing to admit to. So, I'll do my best to talk to the four individuals and we'll start at the far, because he's still sweating here, so we can't start yeah, this yet. Um, <laughs> start on the far end if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us what you do. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Angeline Trevino. I mostly write dystopian urban fantasy and post-apocalyptic fiction with a bit of a feminist edge to it, because why would you ever stick to just one genre? <laughs> Are we coming over to me now? Oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't think you'd... I, no, I thought you were keeping more? going. I, I, okay, I you, you carry you on. Uh, more? I'm, no, I'm right. also a podcaster, <laughs> an events go. manager, a course tutor and um, busy mother of two little boys. So easy job that one, right? Yeah, there that, that's yeah. the easiest bit. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, John? Oh, Hello. sorry, I don't know who you are. Can you introduce yourself? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's John Harvest. I mostly do steampunk fiction. Uh, just started a new series back in 2017, the third of which should be out later this year, hopefully. Uh, there's not much I can say to make myself look interesting now that Angeline has Sorry. stolen the thing there. <laughs> so I shall make it up and I shall say I'm a part-time RAF pilot and I also double as a ghost at uh, weekend meetings where I scare people to death for a certain fee. Awesome. So, uh, top do, one. Does everybody know what steampunk is, by the way? No. No? No. Right. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's basically... Go on. Uh, it's basically an uh, alternative timeline. Imagine the Victorian era but it happened differently with added technology. So if you think of, for example, a Star Wars laser, you know, the pew-pew guns, take one of those, put it in brass and wood, strap it to the side of a Victorian, either in a big fancy dress or a top hat and a frock coat, and you basically got steampunk. It's one of those genres you can do quite a lot with. Coal-fired computers and that type of thing. Yeah, yeah, there we are. Uh, I don't know who you are either, Pat, so you better introduce yeah, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Pat's friends, so I'm trying to better what's come before, yeah. so good luck, David. <laughs> um, well, I'm a white witch, I do spells and I read tarot, so be careful. Um, apart from that, I do, I'm a copywriter by the day, which means I write copy for brochures and websites and adverts and articles. I've just written an article on coronavirus, so if anybody wants to know the ins and outs of coronavirus, I'm the person to talk to. Um, but here tonight in the capacity of fantasy writer, so I've got a trilogy, which is called the Blue Crystal Trilogy, which is um, a uh, paranormal fantasy um, set in an English village, which I was inspired to write when the Twilight books came out, which is what, five or six years ago now, or maybe longer. Um, and I just thought we needed something similar, but in an English setting. It's not vampires, it's something very, very different. So I've been intrigued to read, is it An Angela? Angeline. And Angeline's guide to creating a fantasy world, because it's brilliant, it's just got everything in you could possibly need. So I just kind of fell into it, had a go at it. Um, it's still selling now, which is nice, I didn't, I didn't expect that. But I do all different genres. So I do um, uh, poetry, I do um, chick lit, uh, just started writing an adult ghost story, 
as I also do um, performance poetry as a hideous punk character. So I, I, I feel almost like a bit of a fraud here tonight because I fantasy is one bit of what I do, but then I do other things as well. Ta-da! Okay, David Wake, follow that one. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm David Wake, I write science fiction and steampunk and more, which is shorthand for um, something set in Samurai Japan and uh, a romantic comedy thing that I've written. Um, I have, in fact, written the first draft of a fantasy trilogy, so really I'm here for advice. Um, <laughs> And then, obviously, I've got to top the rest of you, haven't I? So I'm, I'm a part-time explorer on account of my navigation skills. <laughs> how long did, so how come it took you so long to get there? <laughs> <laughs> right, do you want to know anything about me? Good, excellent. Um, I just live in a fantasy world, trust me. I'm a lovable one. I haven't written a script for this, leave me alone. <laughs> right. You want mine? <laughs> You've written a script. I'm not following yours. I've read your books, mate. Um, the, right. So why... Anybody can start. I don't care who starts. Why did you decide to write what you write? That's a good start. Uh, I have always, always been into fantasy and science fiction. It actually started with my dad. He used to read us the bedtime story. That was always his job and he mostly chose books from his own book collection which was pretty much exclusively like classic sci-fi so my bedtime stories as a child were War of the Worlds, Day of the Triffids, The Midwitch Cuckoos which was probably quite inappropriate <laughs> but I loved them and so yeah it was my dad got me into science fiction then I discovered as a child the Choose Your Own Adventure books does anyone remember those? <laughs> where at the end of every chapter it would be like if you choose to take the path through the woods go to page 37 but if you choose to walk down to the beach choose page 15 and I absolutely devoured them through our local library and yeah I, so absolutely I was introduced to it by my dad and it started a lifelong love affair. Uh, John? So Mm. Uh, well, the reason I became a writer is I don't like people very much. So, obviously, as a writer, you can just stay in sort of inside, don't have to have anything to do with people. So, Kill as you can guess. Kill them on the page. Like, yeah. Kill them on the page. Exactly, yes. Yeah. And uh, as you're a writer, you are a living god, whereas here, you're just an idiot sat behind your table with a tie and a swanky waistcoat. So, you know, it's, that's why I wanted to do it. Uh, as far as the steampunk goes, I just started writing Victorian science fiction. Didn't even know steampunk actually existed. And then I found out through accident via the internet that it is actually a known genre, which I was a bit miffed about because I thought I'd invented something completely new. <laughs> so that was going back a good 10 years or so. Uh, and then I discovered something called Bentley Boys. Anyone ever heard of them? No? No, complete blank here. Oh, no, no, no. Well, that's a good lesson on fame because they were really famous in the 1920s and now nobody can remember who they were. But they were very famous motor racing drivers back in the day when motor racing was the top of the tree, a bit like football is today. Um, and I thought this is a great way of setting up a steampunk world, a steampunk version of the Bentley Boys going out racing at the Mars, because you can explore the problems with society, with class, with um, gender issues, uh, sexuality and so on, and do it in this sort of sub-fantasy setting, so people don't realise you're turning them off. It's disguise. I have to say, I, the first time I encountered st steampunk was um, the Darlington Literary Festival, which was one day. And I'd never heard of it. And I went up to this chap, he said, Red Banner, and I said, What's steampunk? And he said, Well, basically, the entails, da da da. He said, Fat, <laughs> can you remember what the question was? No, I can't. No, no, no. Do you dress up? Um, <coughs> well, they're like the whole steampunk. No, I don't. This is just my normal look. Okay. I like to look like I've just been forged for the 19th century by the group. Okay. Well, you succeeded. Thank you very much. <laughs> but some of the steampunk, they all they like little bits of. They do. They wear the yeah. top hats. They have uh, artificial limbs, obviously plated on top of the real limb. Uh, they have cog work and canes and so on. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's if you're <coughs> excuse me, if you're artistic in any way, it is a great genre to work in, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you're very good at making things as well. Uh, if anyone likes sort of Heath Robinson contraptions, then if you can put a Heath Robinson contraption on top of your top hat, you're into steampunk. 
Yeah. It is also a political movement um, in, in the sense that it's trying to reject the society where you throw things away. So you make things to last, you repair things, you, you improve things. So there is a, um, there is a political movement about being polite to people and so forth. Sorry to be politics into it. That's safe <laughs> Well, that's a mechanical age, isn't it? Are you talking about it? You reuse everything? Or are you talking about a bigger... Uh, it is part of the steampunk movement. Yeah. 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 yeah steampunk is very big on recycling. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. going to a charity shop, finding something that's thrown away, go to the tip and repurpose it as something else. The reason I if ask... You, um, as chair, if I don't, I'm going to say, if you don't start talking to the audience, uh, I'm going to put the <laughs> mic in front of you again. <laughs> What were we talking about? I right. I, what was the there. question? I asked you why you write what you write. Is that what I did? Yes, yes it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. why I write what you write. Or why um, you chose to write what you write. Um, well, like, um, uh, so as you know, Angeline. 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 <laughs> I keep wanting to call you Evangeline. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, Angeline. Um, my dad was into John Wyndham and um, David Trippett and all that, so I can, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I can um, sympathise you know, with that. Um, but also, when I was little, there was a top of the form quiz book that I had and one of the questions in it just absolutely intrigued me and it was what does the woman do in H. Ryder Haggard's book she does anybody know the answer she does to that? nothing she does nothing she, she, sit, she sit, sits and queens it which she does, but yeah. there's a bit more of the story yeah. than just that. Yes, yes, right. um, I'm just taking women in general now, so I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, she, And the answer was, she bathes in the flames of eternal youth. And yeah. I just thought, wow, what an amazing idea. How can you bathe in the flames of eternal youth? And it, it's just been with me for since I was about five or six, this idea. And I sort of read the book, I saw the film, I don't know if anybody's ever seen the film, mm. She, with Bernard Cribbins. <laughs> it's <laughs> dire, bad. it's really dire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but a beautiful She, oh, Ursula Andress, I think. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, and I just thought, I just want to do something based on that idea. And then as I said, I'd seen the Twilight books, which are all about vampires. Um, which I, I just loved those, and I loved the films, and I loved the fact she was able to get, was it five books out of this, is she ever going to turn into a vampire? And at the end of every book, she still hadn't turned into a vampire, and we were all despairing, is she ever going to become a vampire? And it took five books for her to get there, I think, was it four or five? Um, and I just thought, I want to do something. In fact, I've kept, friends kept saying, you could write something like that. And I thought, well, let's have a go. But I won't do vampires, because that's probably been done to death. I'll do something different. And then I thought, can I get the flames of eternal youth in here? And I thought, yeah, that's a really good idea. So the whole thing just evolved over a, a period of years, writing it and then rewriting it. And then a publisher got interested in America, which we were just talking about earlier. And um, did, nothing happened with that particular line in the end. But uh, my, originally, my female heroine was 15 years old. And it hadn't even occurred to me, 15 is, like, is a minor, and you've got to be a bit careful what you do. And her boyfriend was 19. So suddenly, you get into the area of, uh, am I being a little bit pervy here? So having to change it all, and they said, no, you've got to make your heroine at least 17. Uh, and as you said, particularly if in America, you've got to be very, very careful about the whole age thing. So I rewrote it again and made it all the characters slightly older. Um, or and then you, you could re uh, rewrite it in Victorian times, and then you can get away with 12. I, <laughs> I could have done that, but yes. You might need to edit that bit out of the finished copy. <laughs> 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 But I wanted to do it in a contemporary yeah, no, setting, no. so I had to make her older. So I actually rewrote the whole thing, changed the characters, and there was quite a significant amount of changes. And then I uh, sent it off again, thinking I'd get a deal, uh, which they, they then said, uh, no, we don't want it, thank you very much. So a bit of a waste of time. But then it, it was an evolving process, and it turned into the, the series as it is today. So that's how it all got started, really. And then it just kind of grew and carried on. There you go. I've had exactly the same problem with one of my characters who's 15. Yes. Um, it, luckily it's in Victorian time, so it's just as a, um, you know, you're 15, why haven't you been married for three years? That's the kind of attitude of everybody else. Um, it's interesting that the whole age thing, you've got to get it right, and particularly this, in this day and age, 
it's got to be age appropriate. And suddenly there's all these things you've got to watch out that you can and can't say. Um, and particularly if you're writing a book for, for children, it hadn't even occurred to me. I just wrote it. I didn't even think who the market was. I just wrote it. And then somebody said, well, actually, it's a young adult book that you've written. And I thought, like, oh, OK. And then suddenly you go into schools talking and, and the whole thing opens up and you realise, actually, yeah, I have got to be careful what I say. And there's always got to be a moral to it. I think that's, I think, a really important thing where the baddies come off worst and the goodies win, and it takes them a long time to get there and all sorts of things happen. But it is essentially a morality story. That way I think it is. I don't know what anybody else thinks uh, about that. I think all writing is about the human condition, so it's got to be about something. The shorthand form of that is to say, and the moral is. Um, we're a bit more sophisticated than that nowadays, but a story's got to be about something. Otherwise, why? It's not about anything. What surprised me was when you, you go on Amazon and you get all kinds of reviews, some are great and some are really bad and really nasty, um, but people take it so seriously and I thought, wow, these people are acting as if my characters are really living beings and they're getting really annoyed with my character for doing one thing and she shouldn't be doing that, that's really bad, why is she doing that? And I think these characters actually come alive on the page for people, so you've actually got a lot of power. As a novelist. The other problem that you get a lot is the common mistake of a lot of these passionate readers mistake what your character is like and what they believe and what they say is what you as the author believe as well and um, there's this wonderful book, I, I love it, called um, Who Runs the World um, and it's set in a distant, like a dystopian future after what happens is a virus, an airborne virus, kills like almost all men, but it only affects men. And so you end up with this world which is only populated by women and they have men tucked away in institutions where they... It's a wonderful book. But you go on Goodreads and you look at the... Um, you look at the reviews on it and the poor author she is being torn apart for like misogyny and like um misogyny no the other one myth oh 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 what's the opposite um, myth uh, oh, misandry. misandry yeah misandry very yeah um but yeah she's she's torn apart over it because her characters say like, yeah, it is quite controversial, but her characters, you've got to remember some of the characters in the book have never even seen a man, let alone actually met or spoken to a man because they're several generations down. And so their understanding of men is that they are just violent, that all the wars that had ever happened were started and fought by men throughout history. And so these, these characters that have never ever laid eyes on a man have this, because of their education, they have an understanding that men are just incredibly violent beings. And yeah, the poor author is ripped apart on Goodreads. Well, it's, it's, because a valid, of this. it's a valid point of view there. It is, yeah. And it's so perfect in the book for people who have never ever met a man. So all they know about men is the history of the world and of course the history of the world isn't like um oh let's learn about this just joe blogs off the street who did a really nice thing <coughs> with his girlfriend <coughs> once you know so how, do they, they, how do they create that if they don't seem they to. have the men in institutions and they just take they it bomb them oh at night <laughs> 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 I mean, I, Helen of troy started the trojan war didn't she but i don't think yeah. she can be blamed for it that much I mean, I, I first got in. I mean, I, by choice, I would read nothing but science fiction. By choice. Unfortunately, I'm chair of the literary festival, and people keep sending me books to read. And would, would you like to pass comment on this? And I think, do you really want me to? You know, uh, some of the rubbish I have to read is, is, is beyond belief, and I do not include yours in that. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. Sir. Anyway, I have read one of your books. <laughs> I'm listened to two. There we go. Um, 
I think the first, when, when I first got into fantasy worlds, there were two books that, the one I remember, it wouldn't have been one of the first ones, it was, um, they created the women's party, it was a short story, I can't remember the heck wrote it, and it was animal farm except with women. The, that was probably a bad analogy, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yes, that right. doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, it'll work. Um, where the pigs became corrupt when they took over, and so did the, um, the, the ladies. They just became as corrupt as everybody else. But the one I can always remember, and I thought, ye gods, why didn't they ever make this into a film? And years later, I found out they had, was the butterfly effect. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. And since then, I've been fascinated by paradoxes. Never managed to write anything because it just becomes you know, as bad as multiple universes and mm. what if, what if, what so if. What, what is the butterfly effect? It's this. It's a theory that it, it's like um, the idea that everything affects everything else. So I can tell the story. The the yeah, the theory is based on if. A butterfly flaps its wings somewhere in yeah. the world. It causes a hurricane in another part of the world. Yeah, yeah, just, just I mean, like what the story was uh, was. Thank God we didn't need, we didn't elect that idiot. Um, you know that right wing pillock that was um, maybe in charge in this particular large nation. Um, the obvious person to talk about here is a certain DJ Trump, but. Um, Thank God he didn't get in yesterday. And they all go back in time to go dinosaur hunting, because it's all right to kill dinosaurs, because they died out. Just don't step off the elevated platform. So you walk on this, you go bang, 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 and all of a sudden this dinosaur goes right a bit close to this bloke. He steps back, falls off the platform, stands on a butterfly, gets back. He's somebody telling a butterfly, comes back and uh, DJ Trump got in. That's the butterfly effect. Not the, Ray Bradbury, isn't it? Thank you. Yeah, it's Ray Bradbury. It is Ray Bradbury. It was. There you go. Got very quiet. You've got your question. A, a question, a comment? Comment. Go on then. Fifty Shades of Grey was Sorry. greatly slated in large parts of America. Does anyone know why? Mm. Pedophilia. What? The backstory is Christian Grey yeah. was with a friend of his mother's when he was 15. So an awful lot of America won't watch it because part of the verbal backstory was paedophilia. What's that got to do with fantasy as well? Well, you were saying about age appropriate. <laughs> oh, right. Oh, yeah. 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 They, they, they burned J.K. Rowling's book because it promotes witchcraft. And then she mentioned that Dumbledore was uh, gay, so they started to burn it for that reason as well. <laughs> Oh, well, there's going to be somebody somewhere that finds something they don't like, aren't they? They're quite welcome to go out and buy my books and burn them if they like. <laughs> I do not care. Uh, you mentioned um, bad reviews. I, it's a question I always ask of, uh, of authors. Short answer. Are you bothered by them? I don't read my reviews. I, I write read. most of my... No, <laughs> <I don't. laughs> no they... I've, I'm talking to other authors, there's quite a polarised split between authors who are like obsessively mm. reading their reviews and the ones like me who don't read them at all. Um, somebody, another author once said to me, um, which made a lot of sense to me, um, your book reviews are not for the author, they're for other readers. And I'm like, yeah, that's fair enough. And actually, it helps my mental health a lot more to not read reviews. I mean, the reason I asked the question in the first place, not just tonight, but always, but I, I often wonder, do you ever get an idea from somebody saying, well, why did that person happen to do that instead of this or... Oh, yeah. Yes? Um, my, my steampunk series, The Doom Doom Club, uh, the, there's three sisters, Ernestine, Georgina and Charlotte. But Ernestine is spelt E-A-R-N, so it's got the A in it. And one of my reviews was, um, you know, I like this book, but you can't spell Ernestine. <laughs> so the next book I wrote, Ernestine, sort of goes on about, well, you know, I'm so glad people spelt my name correctly with the A in it. I'm not quite sure if that's a very passive-aggressive little response. It is, it's really, it is, it's really good. Well, she's quite a passive-aggressive character, so I think that's all right. I think the thing with bad reviews is 
don't engage. That was the advice Absolutely. I was yeah. to engage. And you get so cross. I read them all. I just find it fascinating. <laughs> this anonymity gives somebody the power to tear your work to pieces and accuse you of all sorts of awful things that aren't true. And you just think, if I met that person face to face, they would not be saying those things to me. And yet, because it's anonymous, they can say what they like. And I've had really weird ones. Like, um, I bought this book. I always knew it was going to be rubbish. But I got to the end, and I was right. It was rubbish. And you think, well, why read it? Why buy it? I, 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 I had something with a, with a chap who, who bought, a, bought one of mine. And he absolutely pounded, he did. And then, that. I knew the name, got a vague recollection of his name, when he gave me another appalling review. And I thought, well, if he hated it the first time, why did he buy another one? And then I had a look, and I was intrigued, because it was the only two reviews he'd ever given. So I asked questions about it, and it was Mark Cave who came up with the answer, because he knew him. And apparently he'd written his own book. But he didn't write it as fast as me, so mine came out first, and that was why he panned it. Yes, very good. It, it, it is important to write reviews. If you read a book, do write a review. Um, it doesn't have to be in great detail, just like brilliant five stars. I'll, I'll be Always. That's, that's, that's all. That's all. That's um, but it is nice to get feedback. It is nice in events like this to talk to people who've read something that you've written. Uh, otherwise, we're just doing it in, in, our, in our garrets, um, tapping these things out and they go out. We haven't got a clue. You need a bit of feedback, don't you? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, it's, I'm not, I, at the last convention, I went out with a meal with a group of people, and a little conversation about one of my books started in the other table. And I was desperate to go being cool about it and not you know, <laughs> listening too much. Yeah. But it was kind of really useful. It was in there, like this scene, they're like that scene, and I was thinking, well, I'm taking notes here. The next book I'll definitely have that bit in again. You know? um, it's useful. It is. You, know, you find out what your, what your fans like. And it's lovely when you get a good review and somebody's really, really enjoyed it and you think, yeah, all those blood, sweat and tears I put into it, all those late nights working, actually somebody's read it and they really, really like it. And that's a nice feeling. I mean, it, does, it, does, it is a bit upsetting when you get a really nasty review. Get someone to vet them for you. Yes. They do do services do like that. that. Yeah. No, I like to read them. I, just like to, I like to see the good and the bad. And but yeah, it's really it. nice when, because like people talk to me a lot on social media, and um, give me feedback or link to their nice review. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, personally, I never give five stars. That it, uh, has, there's one golden rule. It, for me to give five stars for a book, I had to wish to God I'd written it. For me to give one star, I just want to kill them. It's always four to two, so I don't, don't be you know, upset if I don't give you five stars. But that's a shame. <laughs> Goodreads is better, that three and four star reviews mean something. Mm. Sadly on Amazon, it's five star or it's rubbish. Yes. Um, it's, it's the perception. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And you get reviews like... Um, the rapping the, was the, terrible. The, yeah, the, I know. The, the, the postman left it on the step and next door, dog edit, one star. <laughs> yeah, one, one star, this was late arriving. Yes. <laughs> I don't think he was very good, but the book was all right, but the packaging was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> I remember the, the, the one review, I, God, she, Tina will tell me who it was in a minute. Uh, she'd written this book, um, and it was about one person at the school gates that inspired it when she went I to pick up the kids. Yeah. You're gonna, depending on what you're going to say, I'm not going to say. No, no, <laughs> but um, this person gave her about 140 bad reviews or something daft, didn't she? She kept Christy, creating accounts. Christy Barlow. Christy Barlow. Yeah. And the person yeah. recognised it or somebody tipped her off. So she gave her all, or she thought it was about her or something like that. Mm. And she gave her all these bad reviews, kept creating accounts. And bad, one star, terrible, all this, that, and the other. Um, so she wrote a book when she made her, was it the, the local um, bike, shall we say? Tidy it up a bit. She created the character was the worst in the, in, in the, yeah, and all everybody else that had said something and backed her up. She made these all the, the bad girls in the in the next book. <clears throat> Just thought it was quite clever, and they never put they never put any reviews on that at all. So. <laughs> So do you think there's all these like secret agendas going on? Oh, with absolutely. Reviews? Yeah. And do people give themselves good reviews? 
Oh, well, I never know. That? There have been cases of that, yeah. 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 I mean, one bloke said, don't buy this, it's rubbish. There's another perfectly good book by somebody else. I don't know who it was, it was the bloke that wrote the book. <laughs> So you can't really believe everything you see in no, the news. No, which you can't. That's why I don't bother with it. You're suggesting that people write things on the internet that are true. Goodness. Ooh. <laughs> the very thought. Surely not. Does this? I, I mean, I follow Donald Trump on on Twitter. I tell you, he tells you a load of um, excellent facts. Let's get back to fantasy world. Yes, yes, yeah. Yes, um, I think you're already there. Well, <laughs> any. You mentioned what inspired you. Um, anything particularly? Go on, I'll let you have first, Pop, because I, I keep leaving you till last time. You had to answer the last question, so I didn't answer <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was a question. I can't for the last one. Um, do you want the last one first or the first one? I just thought there was anything that, that inspired you. Pat mentioned um, she read H. Ryder Haggard, and I just wondered what inspired you when you were younger. Oh, anything? right, I see. Um, I've read a lot of Philip K. Dick um, and Douglas Adams and John Wyndham. Uh, there's lots of science fiction I could find. But that's, I think the question of what inspires me is that there's something that irritates you about the real world. And I've written now, just about to bring out the fourth novel of my irritation of people using their phones all the time. <laughs> Which, is that why you didn't phone me up to tell me you were going to be late? That's part of it. Um, I have a great deal of um, distrust of the devices. Um, yes, I know. I remember the short story. <laughs> yeah, the short story. <laughs> um, and I've got a heck of a lot of material out of it because it is a, it's an ongoing thing. Isn't it? You write science fiction particularly. You're trying to write about the world we live in today, but you exaggerate it slightly. So I'm, I've written one with uh, an artificial intelligence phone uh, to take it that direction. And then the, the police procedural series, um, is re you've got a device stuck in your forehead, so you have to tweet all your thoughts to everybody all the time. There is no privacy. But that's really just taking social media of today and exaggerating it slightly, pushing it so you can talk about it in a different way. Well, absolutely. You, you, you have to set it on what people understand. Mm. This is why Hollywood, all monsters, irrespective of what they are, the, apart with possibly the blob, in Hollywood, all monsters have a head, two arms and two legs, or maybe four legs or something like that, but they are all basically in mammals or mammalian, mm. because otherwise they, nobody relates to the darn things. Uh, there's, uh, who wrote the book? I don't know. There's a famous book from the uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, Called Mission of Gravity, and it's set on a planet that's uh, squashed. Yes. So it's very, it's not spherical, it's, it's like Earth, but more so. And these creatures have to go from one pole to the other, and gravity increases as you go round the equator. And the creatures, it's a very good book in the sense that the creatures are sort of centipede like creatures that, that breathe from their behinds. And on the cover, they have centipede creatures, but they put space helmets on the front of them. And people said, yeah, but that's wrong, isn't it? Yeah. If, if they were going to take breathing apparatus, they would attach it at their behind. And the artist said, look, no one is going to understand a creature with the space helmet stuck on its backside. It's just not going to I think it's incontinence, yeah. yeah. You've got to have some relatability, haven't you? In terms no, of visual sense yeah. or in what you're writing. I mean, you could write a fantastic science fiction book set on an alien world where you used an alien alphabet, for example. In the whole book, but no one will be able to read it. It's a lot of bad idea there. <laughs> <laughs> That's Klingon, isn't it? Klingon, you can do Klingon. That's so plot. Yes, Klingon. Yes. Hmm. So Tolkien's, translated Shakespeare into Klingon. No, Tolkien started by designing the languages first. He did indeed, yeah. So it's not bonkers, is it? Right? No, yeah. So, um, what are you working on? Start doing the same again. Oh well. You don't have to. At the moment, I am writing my second non-fiction guidebook for authors. So I've got hold, hold one up for me, Paul. So th this was my first first non-fiction guidebook. So this this is the, the first book that I wrote, um, which is Thirty Days of World Building: An Author's Step by Step guide to building fictional worlds so this is a workbook with 30 world building prompts in it I so 
I thought this panel was just going to be you reading that book. If that's we we can do that. We can do that. And so the, I'm I'm just finishing up my second one, which comes out later this month, which is called How to Destroy the World: An Author's Guide to Writing Dystopia and Post Apocalypse. So that's what I'm working on. Catchy right title. <laughs> I was trying to work out the acronym, but I couldn't. But yeah. <laughs> John? Uh, not much at the moment, because I'm putting the finishing touches to book three of the series, and then I've got books four and five written, but they also need to be edited. But unfortunately, I'm having a bit of trouble with the publishers, so I'm also going down the publishing route to trying to get the thing out, which does, of course, cut into your creativity time. Uh, the only story I've got on the back burner, which may never see the light of day, is about a spaceship flying through the universe and encounters a huge Gothic castle floating in space but that's going to need a lot of work before it gets anywhere. So in about 10 years, if you ever see that book come out, you know that I've cracked it. <laughs> um, I was going to say, I wish I'd read your book before I started writing, because I didn't even think about there being another world. It just kind of happened as I was writing, things started happening and the, the whole world started to fall into place. But that is a fantastic checklist. So if you're thinking of writing a fantasy novel, read it, because that yeah, is Yeah, yeah, buy one of these really today. <laughs> it's just got everything, everything you can imagine. Uh, how much is it? Um, they're eight pounds today. And limited stock, I imagine. Very limited, because I had to carry it. Well, actually, no, that's a lie. My husband carried it. I would say just taking the credit. <laughs> <laughs> Is it available as a download as well? It is available yeah. as an ebook. The workbook obviously has blank pages so that you can write all your answers to the response in the actual book itself, but it is also available as an ebook. Obviously, without that space, you need to buy your own notebook. So it kind of important, I, isn't it? If I can just interrupt, I, I think that, we, that we've been treated tonight because it's the first time ever that David Wake has not produced an advert that isn't for his own book first. There we go. It's a bit steep, aren't But it is a clever ploy, isn't it? Because if you use that book to write a fantasy book, you've then got to buy another one because you've scribbled in the first one. I know, you know? I know. Genius. It's brilliant, it's brilliant, yeah. Yeah. That never crossed my mind, of course. No. It was written with purity and only the want to help other writers. Your, your entire... Um, sort of publishing model is destroyed by someone with a pencil and a rubber. I think you'll find it, in, in, we should call it an eraser. Oh, sorry. Anyway, no, no. <laughs> I'm going to the American DNA. No, no, I'm just tidying it up for the younger generation, that's all. <laughs> uh, are you all self-published? You just mentioned you're having troubles with the publisher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is a traditional publisher, unfortunately. Name and shame. <laughs> because they bought the publisher that I was with, Accent, and they're not very interested in taking the Accent authors on, unfortunately. Been there, done that, got the t-shirts. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the third one, I'm sort of self-publishing with a friend of mine, uh, Stephen C. Davis, you can go and look up online if you want to. His publishing house is called Tenebrous Texts, but we're just looking into the best way of doing it, how to bring it about, how to move it forward. Probably looking at Lulu. Have you all heard of Lulu? Yes. You know that one? Because apparently that gives you the best money back in terms of royalties. Oh, does it? It does, yes. If Better you than do, Feeder Read. I've never heard of that one. You've never heard of Feeder Read? No. Uh, tried. But I'd, I'd, I'd be interested in hearing the numbers. Yeah, yeah. It still works. I think I've got them in the Feeder Read. Yeah. yeah, it still works. Well, they keep paying me. But apparently what Lulu does, it allows you to put your books on other platforms, whereas obviously Amazon Kindle, it's only on Amazon Kindle. That's Feeder Read do the same. You have to pay a... Uh, something for them to, if you want to put it on Amazon, you have to pay extra if you put it on somewhere else. But no, you, you can set your own price, set your own I think margin. they just do it all automatically. But it depends on, obviously, what you set your cover price at. I think we've worked out the lowest cover price we could charge, I think we get something like a pound 57 profit, split two ways. So obviously... That's a bit difficult with no half P. Yeah. So, obviously, to become a millionaire on that, I would have to sell... I mean, a million. Yeah, <laughs> a million copies. Yeah. Two million. A few million, yes. 
Uh, so this is the wonderful world of publishing. It breaks you and crushes you into dust in the ground. So, it does. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're, we're all actually only 20 years old. We are, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it ages you. I used to be a six foot six Adonis and look at my nose. <laughs> I'm broken. You need to bathe in the flames of music. <laughs> I do, yes. Yeah. Well, I was using virgin bloods for years, but you just can't get all of them. Not in jam with you, won't. No, you won't. <laughs> Um, you self-published, don't you, David? Uh, thank you for very much for that plug. That's uh, all right. I, I self-publish and I have published a book with Andy Conway about how to go about it. Well, pub publishing. So I've read it. I, I own book. it. That's better. Yeah. <laughs> it, and it does why you should do it and then exactly how to go about it. The sort of nitty-gritty of press this button, write that. Yeah. So is that the one with the yellow cover? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Here we go. So, um, and how much are those, David? Uh, uh, I'll, I'll sell this one for less than it's going No, no, no. Uh, <laughs> anything that takes to the air, he has to buy. Uh, I'm selling it for a fiver. And is that not the same book that author Trish Moran bought and thoroughly enjoyed at the Burton Steampunk <laughs> Sci Fi Fantasy Con? It is indeed, yes. <laughs> it is a so yes. Uh, it, <laughs> what am I doing there? I haven't got a clue. Um, yeah. Andy gave this to. Um, well, one of the people he knew, uh, I think one of his students actually, to be to read, you know, please read this, see what it's like. And uh, she looked at this, and she, I don't think she'd even finished it, when she took her book and published it. So she used our book to publish her book faster than we got our own book out. <laughs> <laughs> if you do surprise, David, you charge me a tenner for it. Yeah, I have, yeah. Ooh, that's a bit mean. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, Refund. It was, it was a tenner. But for, for this festival only. There we go, that's better. Yeah. Right. And you publish via Amazon, I believe. Yes? Well, I, I started with a publisher. Yeah. I've had a publisher and an agent. And it wasn't a very nice experience. Do um, tell. Well, I mean, I tried for years to get an agent, and then it just all happened. And then um, it was a small digital imprint. And this. This agent was one of, you know, from the Writers and Artists Year, but they were the people behind uh, Slumdog Millionaire. So I thought, oh, they're pretty good. You know, hit the big time and you get all excited. And um, he was a very, very difficult man to work with. I mean, I learned a lot, I have to say. It was a very brutal, incredibly brutal process. Um, but he got in touch and said, yeah, I really like it, we'd like to publish it. Um, we're doing our own digital imprint, and it was him and a best-selling uh, fantasy writer called Tim O'Rourke. Do you know? Have you heard of Tim O'Rourke? Yeah. yeah. So it's the two of them. He's got like I don't know how many books. He's got loads out, hasn't he? About eighty yeah. books out. He's got loads, and makes a very good living at it. Um, so some good writers have about eighty books, then. Eh? Yes, I believe you have, don't you, Andrew? Roughly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so to cut a long story short, my publisher, my agent, um, Peter taught me a lot, but it was very, very brutal, and he, he wasn't a nice man to deal with, and I found the whole creative process was, was very tough, and book one came out, and that was fine. Book two came out, well, then he said, how quickly can you get book two out? Now I'm working full time, so to try and get a book out quickly, and have a family as well, is, you know, it's, it's tough. And he said, can you get it out in two months? Now, to be asked to write book two, within two months, and I said, well, maybe three, but I can't do two. And I literally, it. Yeah, yeah. And it's, you know, it, you, you create these whole worlds so where everything has to add up and work. And it's quite a complicated setup when you're writing these fantasy books. Um, and I nearly killed myself. I was working till about one or two in the morning every night to get this, this thing out. So I sent it to him in the end. And it came back, he was like, oh, you need to change this, change this, I don't like that. And in the end, I, in fact, I found it the other day, I still kept this email he sent me. You need a complete rewrite, start again. And I just thought, this surely is not what it's about. You should be enjoying this, it shouldn't be a, a chore. And I thought, this is really, really brutal. So I put it away for a couple of weeks. And I literally cried for about two weeks. I was so upset that I put all this energy into it and it hadn't worked. And then I thought, learn from it. You can always learn. Look at his comments. Why does he want you to write it again? And when I came back to it, which is probably about three or four weeks later, I just sort of took a complete break. And I thought, actually, I think he's right. The characters aren't quite in. What he was saying was, 
In a fantasy trilogy, you've got to up it all the time. So you start there, you have to have a denouement, you have to have a you know, climactic ending to the first one. But the second book starts where that left off, and it goes up, and then it goes up again. And it has to be different battles, different monsters, different things happening. You have to keep the reader guessing all the time. And then your third book's even harder, because you have to up it again and again and again. And in your third book, all the subplots have to come together, all the different strands, all the different stories, all the, the different plot lines, everything has to come together. And it's actually quite a, a strategic exercise to make sure they all come together. Because you, suddenly you think, oh, my timeline doesn't work, and then you've got to go back through it all. They really, really, in my experience, it can be very complex complicated things to write but when you've got a publisher breathing down your neck who comes out with a cover that you don't like because I think the cover is all important and the cover really sells the book I've had that with them um, when I've got out at the moment which is a collection of ghost stories it's selling because the cover is really good I've got a, a good artist that I work with and he came up with a really good cover and time and again I get reviews saying I bought this for the cover and like, that's really interesting so when my publisher came out with this cover I didn't like. And I said to him, well, it's not really how I would do it. And and said, you're not going to buy it by, by the cover. <laughs> you, you're not going to think anybody else is. Exactly. Going to, you know, you've, got, you've got to sell it And to he you. just said, read your contract. We design the cover. Mm. We put the price point on it. And I just thought, I really don't like this. It's too expensive. And I just, I was kept in the dark, but I still had to do all the promotion. I had to do all the visits, the talks, all the social media. I produced a lot of swag, you know, I did my um, bookmarks and all the, the gifts that you give away. So I was working really hard and giving away 50% of any profits to, um, to the publisher. So in the end, I think it very much came to a, an amicable ending. We both decided this is not working for either of us. And he gave me the rights back, which is great. I didn't have to fight for the rights. And then Tim O'Rourke, who was sort of part of the, um, the publishing company they put together, he gave me a masterclass in how to self-publish. So I really learned a lot. And I was going to go to a company and pay them to do it. And he said, don't do that. He said, you can self-publish on Amazon, via Kindle. You can also do Smashwords and um, D2D, digital to digital. Draft to digital. Draft to, di Draft draft to digital. Um, and he said, go on those as well, because that helps you manipulate the price. And he just taught me how to do it. And if, I spent three weeks learning how to do it, and that's if, what I if did. You take one, if you're a writer and you want to publish, um, if, if there's one thing you take away from this meeting is you do not need to pay somebody to do this. Never. If somebody charges you. I've yeah. heard of people we've charged Vanity two grand. Publishing, no way. Yeah. No, no, but the money comes to the writer, not the other way around. Absolutely. Hundreds. I, I know people who've spent 2,000 quid yeah. for a mm -hmm. box of books. It's, it's upsetting because you it can do it in for nothing. Mm -hmm. you know. How many times have we said to them, why didn't you talk to me first? But, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to come back to Pat's point about you, you write a first book, and then you've got to up the, um, the ante in the second book, haven't you? Yeah. So that's, that's, that's following Angeline's first book on world building and the second book on destroying the world, isn't it? That's, well, that's, that's I guess actually yeah. how it goes. Yeah. yeah. But what's, yeah. what the hell is my third book going to be yeah. then? You destroy the universe? <laughs> <laughs> You're destroying my universe, Lucas? I don't know. I've created it quite well. Um, how do you go about are the worlds you create where you want to live? No. No. Where I, you don't I, want to live, then? I do not want to live in my worlds. I write dystopia, dystopia and post-apocalypse. Right. I mean, <laughs> no, I assume you don't want to live in a world where we're just polluting it with coal, burning... Uh, no, probably as well. That's why Pedro, I she lives very much in our world, even though it's disguised. It is a world of you know, racism, conflict, sexism and so on. Well, we so, already know Pat's a, a white witch, so <laughs> yes, you do want to live in a world where... Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to live in a world I bet you would. Yeah, great. I'm intrigued, Mr. Wake. Do you, <laughs> do you want to live in your world? Uh, the, the one I'm writing at the moment, the Thinkosphere world, where you, you tweet all your thoughts to everybody else. And I, 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 I know you don't want well, to live in the Ophir. Everybody <laughs> wants to live in that. That's why they, they, they send pictures of their breakfast to each other and, and, <laughs> and, and stuff. Um, there's, there's obviously no crime in my world because you can't do any premeditated murder because any plan you give away straight away. Um, yeah, of course, absolutely. Sounds I can't fabulous. think of anything uh, better than having every single person in the world prying into your affairs. On that note... <laughs> um... <laughs>
not very often, if you are, not very often I'm left speechless, <laughs> Blake. Um, I think we're going to take about a 10 minute break, because I need a pint. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, Brian agrees, so there we are. Uh, and then we'll reconvene and uh, go for it, chaps. Okay? Alright? Thank you very much. Show sure.